Attention. Attention refers to systems involved in the selection and prioritization of information processing, and it is intimately linked with perception and memory and is thus central to almost everything we do. We can direct attention intentionally, for example when we move our eyes around the environment to search the visual scene for something specific, or when we tune in to listen to a conversation in a noisy room. Attention can also be captured unintentionally, for example when a sudden movement catches our eye, or when we hear a familiar sound such as our name being spoken, and it seems to pop out from the noise in a crowd. Attention also refers to a more general, non-selective state of alertness or arousal. Experiments have shown that it is possible to distinguish these different aspects, and studies of brain activity have revealed that attention involves multiple areas of the brain working together. The most characteristic property of attention is that it is limited. DeSimone and Duncan, 1995, said that, the first basic phenomenon is limited capacity for processing information. At any given time only a small amount of information available on the retina can be processed and used. William James, 1890, said that, everyone knows what attention is. It is the taking possession of mind in clear and vivid form of one out of what would seem several simultaneous possible objects or trains of thought. William James went on to say, focalization, concentration of consciousness is of its essence. It implies the withdrawal from some things in order to deal effectively with others. Here James adds some further properties of attention, in particular that attention may be given to external or internal stimuli and that what is attended becomes consciously available to us. When we are conscious of something, that information is held in short-term working memory, which can only maintain and manipulate a limited amount of information. We are also limited because we can only look in one direction at once, reach for one thing with one hand, or say one word at a time. These limitations necessitate the use of attention to select and prioritize which information to process. Everyday activities like supermarket shopping challenge our attention. What do we want? Where shall we look? Which one shall we reach for? Filter theory. The concentration provided by the process of attention helps us in the clarity of the perception of perceived object or phenomenon. Thus, attention is not merely a cognitive factor but is essentially determined by emotions, interest attitude and memory. To explain these findings, Broadbent 1958 proposed a filter theory of attention, which states that there are limits on how much information a person can attend to at any given time. Therefore, if the amount of information available at any given time exceeds capacity, the person uses an attentional filter to let some information through and block the rest. The filter is based on some physical aspect of the attended message, the location of its source or its typical pitch or loudness, for instance. Only material that gets past the filter can be analyzed later for meaning. This theory explains why so little of the meaning of the unattended message can be recalled. The meaning from an unattended message is simply not processed. Put another way, According to Paschler, 1998, Broadbent's filter theory maintains that the attentional filter is set to make a selection of what message to process early in the processing, typically before the meaning of the message is identified. Does this mean people can never pay attention to two messages at once? Broadbent, 1958, thought not, believing instead that what is limited is the amount of information we can process at any given time. Two messages that contain little information, or that present information slowly, can be processed simultaneously. For example, a participant may be able to attend simultaneously to more than one message if one repeats the same word over and over again, because it would contain little information. In contrast, messages that present a great deal of information quickly take up more mental capacity, fewer of them can be attended to at once. The filter thus protects us from information overload by shutting out messages when we hear too much information to process all at once. Other investigators soon reported results that contradicted filter theory. Moray, 1959, discovered one of the most famous, called the, cocktail party effect, shadowing performance is disrupted when one's own name is embedded in either the attended or the unattended message. Moreover, the person hears and remembers hearing his name. You may have had a similar experience at a crowded social gathering. While engaged in conversation with one or more people, you hear someone behind you say your name. Until your name was spoken, you, heard, nothing that speaker was saying, but the sound of your name seemed to reach out and grab your attention. Why does the cocktail party effect pose a problem for filter theory? Filter theory predicts that all unattended messages will be filtered out, that is, not processed for recognition or meaning, which is why participants in dichotic listening tasks can recall little information about such messages. The cocktail party effect shows something completely different. People sometimes do hear their own name in an unattended message or conversation, and hearing their name will cause them to switch their attention to the previously unattended message. Moray, 1959, concluded that only, important, 
material can penetrate the filter set up to block unattended messages. Presumably, messages such as those containing a person's name are important enough to get through the filter and be analyzed for meaning. Left unexplained, then, is how the filter knows which messages are important enough to let pass. Paschler, 1998, says that the participants did not always hear their name in the unattended channel. When not cued in advance to be vigilant, only 33% of the participants ever noticed their names. Thus an alternative explanation for the name recognition finding is that the shadowing task does not always take 100% of one's attention. Therefore, attention occasionally lapses and shifts to the unattended message. During these lapses, name recognition occurs. Traisman, 1960, discovered a phenomenon that argues against this alternative interpretation of the cocktail party effect. She played participants two messages, each presented to a different ear, and asked the participants to shadow one of them. At a certain point in the middle of the messages, the content of the first message and the second message was switched so that the second continued the first and vice versa. Immediately after the two messages, switched ears, many participants repeated one or two words from the, unattended ear. Attenuation theory. Psychologist Anne Traisman, 1960, proposed a modified filter theory, one she called attenuation theory. Instead of considering unattended messages completely blocked before they could be processed for meaning, as in filter theory, Traisman argued that their volume was turned down. In other words, some meaningful information in unattended messages might still be available, even if hard to recover. She explained this idea as follows. Incoming messages are subjected to three kinds of analysis. In the first, the message's physical properties, such as pitch or loudness, are analyzed. The second analysis is linguistic, a process of parsing the message into syllables and words. The third kind of analysis is semantic, processing the meaning of the message. Some meaningful units, such as words or phrases, tend to be processed quite easily. Words that have subjective importance, such as your name, or that signal danger, fire. Watch out. Have permanently lowered thresholds, that is, they are recognizable even at low volumes. You might have noticed yourself that it is hard to hear something whispered behind you, although you might recognize your name in whatever is being whispered. Words or phrases with permanently lowered thresholds require little mental effort by the hearer to be recognized. Thus, according to Treisman's theory, the participants in Moray's experiments heard their names because recognizing their names required little mental effort. Only a few words have permanently lowered thresholds. However, the context of a word in a message can temporarily lower its threshold. If a person hears, the dog chased the. The word cat is primed, that is, especially ready to be recognized. Even if the word cat were to occur in the unattended channel, little effort would be needed to hear and process it. This explains why people in Treisman's experiment switched ears, hearing the previous words in a sentence primed the participants to detect and recognize the words that followed, even when those words occurred in the unattended message. According to Traisman, 1964, people process only as much as is necessary to separate the attended from the unattended message. If the two messages differ in physical characteristics, then we process both messages only to this level and easily reject the unattended message. If the two messages differ only semantically, we process both through the level of meaning and select which message to attend to based on this analysis. Processing for meaning takes more effort, however, so we do this kind of analysis only when necessary. Messages not attended to are not completely blocked but rather weakened in much the way that turning down the volume weakens an audio signal from a stereo. Parts of the message with permanently lowered thresholds, significant, stimuli, can still be recovered, even from an unattended message. Note the contrasts here between attenuation theory and filter theory. Attenuation theory allows for many different kinds of analyses of all messages, whereas filter theory allows for only one. Filter theory holds that unattended messages, once processed for physical characteristics, are discarded and fully blocked. Attenuation theory holds that unattended messages are weakened but the information they contain is still available. Late selection theory. Broadbent's 1958, filter theory holds that no information about the meaning of an unattended message gets through the filter to be retained for future use. Treisman's 1964, attenuation theory allows for some information about meaning getting through to conscious awareness. Deutsch and Deutsch 1963 proposed a theory, called the late selection theory, that goes even further. Later elaborated and extended by Norman 1968, this theory holds that all messages are routinely processed for at least some aspects of meaning, that selection of which message to respond to thus happens, late, in processing. According to this model, all incoming information was analyzed semantically and assessed in terms of whether it was pertinent or not. All irrelevant informations are filtered out later. Note that filter theory hypothesizes a bottleneck, 
a point at which the processes a person can bring to bear on information are greatly limited, at the filter. Late selection theory also describes a bottleneck but locates it later in the processing, after certain aspects of the meaning have been extracted. All material is processed up to this point, and information judged to be most important is elaborated more fully. This elaborated material is more likely to be retained. Unelaborated material is forgotten. A message's importance depends on many factors, including its context and the personal significance of certain kinds of content, such as your name. Also relevant is the observer's level of alertness. At low levels of alertness, such as when we are asleep, only very important messages, such as the sound of our newborn's cry, capture attention. At higher levels of alertness, less important messages, such as the sound of a television program, can be processed. Generally, the attentional system functions to determine which of the incoming messages is the most important. This message is the one to which the observer will respond. How well does the evidence for late selection theory measure up? Different theorists take different positions on this issue. Paschler, 1998, argues that the bulk of the evidence suggests it is undeniably true that information in the unattended channel sometimes receives some processing for meaning. At the same time, it appears true that most results thought to demonstrate late selection could be explained in terms of either attentional lapses, to the attended message, or special cases of particularly salient or important stimuli. In any event, it seems unlikely that unattended messages are processed for meaning to the same degree as are attended messages.